I'll be back, you guys. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. This your girl Tiffany coming through here live in the fake. So today's subject, I'm gonna be talking about Juni Creole. Right. So Juni Creole, which means National Creole Day, which is gonna be celebrated on October the 28th, right? So it's celebrated on the last Friday of the month and in the last Sunday of the month. Okay. So you got two things going on. You got the hoodoo heritage month and you got the creole day that's taking place all right or also the creole heritage month as well all right so as i was digging through information um i was seeing that this particular holiday is mostly celebrated within saint lucia and dominica not dominican republic but dominica dominica is a caribbean island um not many people know about it because it's not very well known or very popular. Um, I know that some people might be familiar with St. Lucia. All right. But they mainly celebrate this holiday in those Caribbean islands, in those places. And also, um, I came across a lot of information about the Creoles in America, and particularly Louisiana. So I'm going to share those information as much as I possibly can. So I have to be able to try to break it down to where I can be able to do this video um, with good sources available. But before I continue, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, like the channel, share the channel, hit the notification bell, all that great stuff. So and thank you guys that has been supporting my page. Thank you so much. Let me see who's over here. Kent. What's up, Kent? Shout out to Kent. What's up? All right, so let me go ahead and get started, okay? Yes, let's get started. I was over here vibing to some good old house music, you know, as I was gathering up information. So I was like, yes, let me put some house music on. So I love some house music. Shout out to the house music people out there. Shout out to the house music DJs that's doing their thing. I mean, there's variety types of them, so. Yeah, I'm a fan, but I'm a fan of Afro house music. I love the sound. I love how the beat goes and whatnot. All right, here we go. So first, let's start with what is Juni Carrillo. All right, Juni Carrillo is celebrated in the Caribbean islands of Dominica and St. Lucia on the last Friday of October and the last Sunday of October, respectively, and has been held annually since 1984. Throughout the preceding week, the various villages on both islands host cultural events and festivals which showcase different elements of their heritage and culture. Moreover, there are displays of local dishes and foods such as roast, bread, breadfruit, Coupe, a sweet bread made by mixing spices and sugar into flour and kneading it, then baking it, usually served at breakfast. So, kalalu soup and green fig and saltfish, the national dish of St. Lucia. Farine balls, a dish made with avocado and farine. So, uh, just to go ahead and skip down, that's just some of the dishes they make. So it also talks about the local drinks, which are available, such as the cocoa tea, the Sorrel juice, different types of alcohol punch. Then going down here, it says, apart from the variety of cultural foods, the day is commemorated with traditional folk music or Creole music, some of which have been passed down from prior generation. The most widely used instrument during Creole Day performances besides vocals are the shot shock and the boom boom, according tambourine and tambos. 
Most people usually observe Juni Creole by wearing the island's national wear, which is composed of Wab Dwe and Jip and symbol for the women and a Madras jacket while white shirt, black sacks, excuse me, black slats and red, red sash for the men. However, the modern day individuals do typically use Madras at, to make less formal variation of the national wear. This event is even celebrated at schools where students are allowed to dress in their Madras outfit and take part in the aforementioned activities. This has become a custom in the islands of Dominica and St. Lucia. All right, so that's that information. That's that particular information. So now we're gonna go ahead and go into, I'm gonna go ahead and go into St. Lucia and Dominica. But before I go there, I wanna say shout out to all my Creole brothers and sisters out there all over the world, whether you are a Haitian, whether you're from Louisiana, Texas area, or part of Mississippi, okay? Whether you out in St. Lucia, Dominica, shout out to y'all. Um, I just want to give y'all y'all flowers, y'all commemorates, and recognize y'all. So shout out to all my all my Creole people out there. Okay, so I think that is very important that we know about the Creole folks. You know, so I just want to give a special shout out to you guys. All right, so now let's talk about St. Lucia. So let's go into that information. Now, where's St. Lucia? So St. Lucia is an island country in the West Indies in the Eastern Caribbean Sea on the boundary with the Atlantic Ocean. The island was previously called Ionola, the name given to the island by the native Arocs and later Hironora, the name given by the native Caribs, two separate Amer 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 Amerindian peoples, part of the Windward Islands of the Lesser Antilles. It is located north and northeast of the island of St. Vincent, northwest of Barbados and South Martinique. But check this out. The French were the first Europeans to settle on the island. They signed a treaty with the native island Caribs in 1660. England took control of the island from 1663 to 1667. In, in the ensuing years, it was at war with France 14 times. The rule of island changed frequently. In 1814, the British took control of the island because it switched so often between British and French control. St. Lucia was also known as the Helen of the West after the Greek mythological character Helen of Troy. And it goes on to say representative government came about in 1840. Universal suffrage was established in 1953. From 1958 to 1962, the island was a member of the West Indies Federation. On February 22, 1979, St. Lucia became an independent state and a member of the Commonwealth of Nation as Commonwealth of Realm. St. Lucia is a mixed jurisdiction, meaning that it has a legal system based in part on both the civil law and English common law. The civil code of St. Lucia of 1867 was based on the Quebec civil code of 1866 as supplemented by English common law. Les legislation is also member of Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. All right. So the name St. Lucia was named after St. Lucie of Syracuse. St. Lucia and Ireland are the only two sovereign states in the world named after a woman. Ireland is named after the Celtic goddess of fertility, Ari. St. Lucia is the only one named after a human woman. Legend states that French sailors were shipwrecked on the island on December 13, the feast day of St. Lucie, and therefore named the island in her honor. Mm, isn't that interesting? Okay. So now let's go down to the 18th and 19th century, right?
All right, so after the slave-based sugar industry developed, both the British and the French found the island attractive. During the 18th century, the island changed ownership and was declared neutral territory a dozen times, although the French settlement remained on the island, was a de facto French colony well into the 18th century. All right, so it says in 1722, George the First of Great Britain granted both Saint Lucia and Saint Vincent to the Second Duke of Montagu. Montagu appointed Nathaniel Irwin, a merchant sea captain and adventurer, as de deputy governor. Irwin went to the islands with a group of seven ships and established settlement in Pite Carnage, unable to get enough support from British warship, he and the new colonists were quickly run off by the French. Now let's go downhill. Ooh. So it says in 1803, the British regained control of the island. Many, many members of the Le Armée Française, the Le Boys, escaped into the thick rainforest where they evaded capture and established maroon communities and i do have some information about the maroon community in both saint lucia and dominica so going on to say slavery on the island continued for a short time but anti-slavery sentiment was rising in britain the british stopped the import of slaves by anyone white or color when they abolished the slave trade in 1807 so France and Great Britain continued to contest St. Lucia until the British secured it in 1814 as part of the Treaty of Paris ended the Napoleonic Wars. Thereafter, St. Lucia was considered one of the British Windward Islands colonies. All right, so it says the institution of slavery was abolished on the island in 1836 as it was throughout the British Empire. At the abolition, all former slaves had to serve a four-year apprenticeship to accustom them to the idea of freedom. During that period, they worked for their former masters for at least three quarters of the work week. Full freedom was duly granted by the British in 1838. By that time, people of African ethnicity greatly outnumbered those of ethnic European background. People of Caribbean descent also comprised a minority on the island. Okay, so let's go down where it says 20th century. So the Second World War visited the islands directly during the Battle of the Caribbean when German U-boat attacked and sank two British ships in Castries Harbor on March the, March the 9th of 1942. The United States Navy set up NAF St. Lucia at the Gross Islet. In the mid 20th century, St. Lucia joined the West Indies Federation. When the colony was dissolved in 1967, St. Lucia became one of the six members of West India Association states. With, inter with internal self government in 1979, it gained full independence under Sir John Compton of the Conservative United Workers' Party. The new country chose to remain with the British Commonwealth and to retain Queen Elizabeth as monarch, represented locally by a governor general. Okay, so let's go down to where it talks about ethnic group. So as of 2010 census, St. Lucia population is predominantly of African and mixed at 96.13%, 85.28% black and 10.85% mixed. Okay, so other groups include the Indo-Caribbean people and white St. Lucia at 0.61%. Other unspecified group account for 1.1% of the population. So the language is St. Lucian French Creole, which is colloquially referred to as Patois. It's spoken by 95% of the population. This Atelian Creole is used in literature and music and is gaining official 
acknowledgement as it developed during the early period of French colonization, the Creole is derived chiefly from the French and West African languages with some vocabulary from the island Carib language and other sources. Antillian Creole is also spoken in Dominica, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and to a lesser extent, St. Vincent and Grenada. It also resembled the Creole spoken in French, Guiana, Haiti, Martis, or Maritis, Maritis, excuse me, and the uh, Salad, Salad Chilis. I don't know how to say that. But anyways, St. Lucius or St. Lucia is a member of La Francophonie. So, out of curiosity, what is La Francophonie? All right, so the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, or La Francophonie, all right, is um, an international organization representing countries and regions where French is a lingua franca and customary language, where a significant proportion of the population are francophones, which means French speakers, or where there is a notable affiliation with French culture. Mm. All right, so what we see what St. Lucia have in common with those in Louisiana and Haiti is French. Okay. So in Louisiana, especially, uh, they do speak Creole, but the Creole they speak is combined with English, of course, with French and other native languages. Okay. But let's continue with the information. Um, and so going down talk about religion is the main Christianity is the main religion in St. Lucia. About 61.5% of the population is Roman Catholic. Another 25.5% belong to Protestant denomination. Okay. And evangelical comprise 2.3% of the population and 1.1% of Jehovah's Witnesses. In addition, about 1.9% of the population adheres to the Rastafari movement. Other religions include Hinduism, Bahi, faith, Judaism, and Buddhism. All right, so it goes into the culture. So the culture of St. Lucia has been influenced by African, East Indian, French, and English heritage. One of the secondary languages is St. Lucian French Creole or Creole, spoken about almost all of the population. All right, so St. Lucia brought the highest ratio of noble lotteries produced with respect to the total population of any sovereign country in the world. The two winners have come from St. Lucia. St. Arthur Lewis won the Nobel Peace Prize in Economic in 1979, and the poet Derek Wilcott received the National Peace Nobel Peace Prize in Literature in 1992. So go down and talk about the festival. It says the festivals, cultural festivals include La Rose, Celebrate on August 30th, which is my birthday, and La Matare, October the 17th, the first representing a native St. Lucian fraternal society known as the Order of the Rose that is fashioned in the mold of Rosicrucian, Rosicrucianism. Interesting. And the second representing its traditional rival, the native St. Lucian equivalent of Freemasonry known as the Order of the Marguerite. References to their origin as version of pre-existing external secret societies can be seen in a mural painting by Dalton St. Omar depicting the Holy Trinity of Osiris, Horus, and Isis. Oh, you know what? Speaking of that, I would like to look that up. Let's look that up.
All right. Let's see. Move. All right, so I want to show the picture of the painting. Let's see, painting. All right, so this is one of the painting by the St. Lucius painter himself by the name of Dunstan St. Omar. Okay. So I don't think this is the correct painting, but this is a beautiful painting by him. All right. So I just wanted to show that. All right. Uh, let me see who's in the chat. Hello, Henry. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Let's go ahead and continue on. So, the biggest festival of the year is St. Lucia Jazz Festival, held in early May at multiple venues throughout the island. It draws visitors and musicians from all for around the world. The grand finale of the main stage is held at Pigeon Island, which is located to the north of the island. Traditionally, like other Caribbean countries, St. Lucia hosts a carnival before Lent. In 1999, the government moved carnival to mid-July to avoid competing with the much larger Trinidad and Tobago carnival and so as to attract more overseas visitors. In May of 2009, St. Lucian commemorated the 150th anniversary of West Indian heritage on the island. All right, so that's that information about St. Lucia. So now let's go into the next information, which is about the Dominica. Not Dominican Republican, but Dominica. All right. So go over here real fast. Dominica. So Dominica, officially the Commonwealth of Dominica, is an island country in the Caribbean. The capital is Razo is located on the western side of the island is geographically situated as part of the windward islands chain in the lesser antilles archipel Ar archipelago your yeah, archipelago in the caribbean sea dominica's closest neighbors are two constitute territories of the european union the overseas departments of france guadeloupe to the northwest and martinique to the south Southeast. Dominica comprises a land area of 750 kilometers, and the highest point is Marne Dobolton. Or was it Dabolton? Dabolton. So the population was 71,293 at the 2011 census. All right. So it goes into the story. Um, the island was settled by the Arawak arriving from South America in the 15th century. The Kalinago displaced the Arawak by the 15th century. Columbus is said to have passed the island on Sunday, November 3rd of 1493. It was later colonized by Europeans, predominantly by the French. From the 1690s to the 1763, the French imported enslaved people from West Africa to Dominica to work on coffee plantation. Great Britain took possession in 1763 after the Seven Years' War, and it gradually established English as its official language. The island gained independence as a republic in 1978. So it has been nicknamed the Nature Island of Caribbean for its natural environment. It is the youngest island in the Lesser Antilles, and in fact, it is still being formed by geo 
thermal volcanic activity as evidenced by the world's second largest hot spring called Bowling Lake. The island has lush mountainous rainforest and it is the home of many rare plants, animals, and bird species. Okay. So it was given by Christopher Columbus. That's how he got his name. So it was the French colony. So Spain had little success in colonizing Dominica. In 1632, the French uh, Combone de Il de la Amerique claimed it and other Pites Antilles for France, but no physical occupation took place. So between 1642 and 1650, French missionary Raymond Britton became the first regular European visitor to the island. All right, so in 1660, the French and English agreed that Dominica and St. Vincent should not be settled, but instead left to the Carib as a neutral territory. But its natural resources attract expeditions of English and French foresters who began harvesting timber. In 1690, the French established their first permanent settlement, French woodcutters from Martinique and Guadeloupe began to set up timber camps to supply the French islands with wood and they gradually became permanent settlers. They brought the first enslaved Africans from West Africa to Dominique as they call it in French. All right, so in 1715, a revolt of poor white smallholders in the North Martinique known as La Gole called settler to migrate to Southern Dominique where they set up small holdings. So let's go further down. So Great Britain established a small colony in 1805. It used Dominica as part of the transatlantic slave trade by which slaves were imported and sold as labor in the islands as part of a trade that includes producing and shipping sugar and coffee as commodities crops to Europe. The best documented slave plantation on the island is Hollowborough Estate, which had 71 males and 68 female slaves. The great the great family were notable. Thomas Hogerson, a brother-in-law owned a slave ship and Thomas Gregg and his son John Gregg were part owners of sugar plantation on Dominica. Right in January of 1814, 20 slaves absconded from excuse me, absconded from Hillelburg. They were recorded as recaptured and punished with 100 lashes applied to the males and 50 for the females. Yikes. The slaves reportedly said that one of their people had died in the plantation hospital and they believed he had been poisoned. But in 1831, reflecting a liberalization of official Brit British racial attitude, the Brown Privilege Bill conferred political and social rights on free black, mostly free people of color who generally were of mixed race with African European ancestry. The Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, British and the institution of slavery throughout its empire, except in India. Hmm. Well, let's go down to how it gains independence, right? So going out early 20th century, World War I, many Dominicans, mainly the sons of small Farmers volunteered to fight in Europe for the British Empire after the war. An upsurge of political consciousness throughout the Caribbean led to the formation of the Representative Government Association, right? And until 1958, Dominica was gover governed as part of the British Windward Islands. Caribbean islands saw independence from 1958 to 1962, and Dominica became a province of the short-lived West Indies Federation in 1958. After Federation dissolved in 1962, Dominica became an 
became an associate state of the United Kingdom in 1967 and formally took responsibility for its internal affairs. So November 3rd, 1978, the Commonwealth of Dominica was granted independence as a republic led by Prime Minister Patrick John. All right, so let's go down to demographics. So the language is English, right? In addition, Dominican Creole and Antillian Creole based on French is widely spoken. Okay, so along with Creole, a dialect known as Coco or Coco, yeah, is spoken. It is a type of Pigeon English, which is a mix of Leeward Island English Creole and Dominican Creole, and is mainly spoken in the northeastern villages of Marga Mar and Wesley by the descendant of immigrants from Maserat and Antigua. Over the time, there has been much intermarian but there are still traces of difference in origin as a result of this mixture of lit of languages and heritage dominica is a member of both the french speaking francophone and the english speaking commonwealth a nation all right so its religion is 61.4 percent of the population which is Roman Catholic, though in recent years, a number of Protestant churches have been established. About 10 to 12% of the population belong to one of the seven day denomination, the, the which includes Yahweh Congregation, Church of God, and the seven day Adventist church. And then it goes on to say, according to Association of Religion Data Arc, archives in 2010, the World Christian Database report that the largest non-Christian religious groups include spiritualism followed by 2.6% of the population, Baha'i followed by 1.7%, Agnosticism followed by 0.5%, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam each followed by 0.1%, and Chinese folk religion, neo-religions, and atheism each followed by non-nelegable -ne yeah, non-negligible proportion of population. The nation's first mosque was built near Ross University. Interesting. So now uh, they talk about the education. Let's go down to the culture. So the Dominican cuisine is similar to that of Caribbean islands, particularly Jamaica, St. Lucia, and Trinidad and Tobago. All right, so common vegetables include plantains, tanayas, sweet potatoes, potatoes, rice, and peas. All right, so uh, that's the information. If you guys want to read up more, you guys can just simply look on Wikipedia and just look up the information about Dominica and St. Lucia. So now I want to get into the books that um, I chose and I think that would be a good recommendation for the people to look up and read into. So again, um, so again, I um, I tried to find as much information about uh, Juni Creole as far as like you know, just try to find a book on it. But I really couldn't come across any sources that deals with that particular holiday in itself. But I did find some sources that dealt with St. Lucia and Dominica as far as the Maroons is concerned, of course, about the um, Creoles in America, in the American South, and particularly like Louisiana. Somebody said they are looking forward to. Oh, they are currently in St. Lucia, looking forward to the festival this weekend. Well, I hope y'all. I hope you're enjoying yourself out there, cause I wish I can go. I wish I can go to the islands, cause I want to be able to go out there and celebrate and have a good time too. You know what I'm saying? I wish I can go out there, cause I would love to see what St. Lucia is like as an island. I really do. I wish I can go to the islands. I ain't never been to the islands before, but I would love to go visit. 
and I would love to take part in today's festivity and be able to enjoy the music, vibe with the people and whatnot. But I hope you enjoy yourself and I hope you're being safe out there. So shout out to you. Shout out to you, my dear friend. All right, so now one of the books that I have that I want to go into. Somebody put, hold on. Let me read this comment. Oh, okay. You're from the islands. Cool. I thought you went on the vacation. Okay. That's great. That's wonderful. We got somebody that's actually from the islands. We got somebody who is um, from St. Vincent, but they in St. Lucia right now. So that's even great. That's cool right there. You know, we got somebody in the session. Shout out to Brother Majesty or Mesthetic Son Allah. Shout out to you. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for coming through. Wow, that's interesting. He come from the islands. All right, we got Islander in the building. <laughs> All right, now, anyways, we got this book right here, which is called The, uh, the American Creoles, the Franco Phony Caribbean and the American South, which is edited by Mark Morrow and Cecilia Britton. All right, so um, let's go into Let's go into where it says the Caribbean and Creole in New Orleans. So it says, zoom that up. All right, here we go. So it says, while most of the United States has historically been dominated by black, white, racial, binary, New Orleans, as well as many other parts of Louisiana has long been shaped. It has been long been shaped by a, a triple Triparte division that included a thriving community of free people of color who were socially in between and distant from enslaved blacks and free whites. This division was nurtured by Louisiana Spanish and French colonial rulers and then significantly revigorated by the migration of nearly 10,000 refugees from the Haitian Revolution who fled their first refuge in eastern Cuba to settled in New Orleans in 1809. In the research discussed here, I examine how these historical ties to the Caribbean continue to shape the way many in New Orleans understand their culture and describe their racial and ethnic identification. So now let's go down. And it says, French, Spanish, and Caribbean, the main, the many roots of New Orleans. So New Orleans often seen as being different. This is as true today as it was in 1819 when Benjamin Henry Latrobe La visited and wrote that everything had been had an odd look. He found it difficult to not not to stare at a site wholly new, new even to one. Who has traveled much in Europe and America. Today, New Orleans continues to stand out for its unique cultural landscape and is often called the northernmost point of the Caribbean. The city's history helps to account for this linkage. In the public imagination of the New Orleans with the Caribbean, as part of the Louisiana Territory during its colonial era, New Orleans was ultimately part of the French and Spanish colonial regimes. Its history is thus intimately tied to the his, histories of the Spanish and French-speaking Caribbean. This diverse colonial 
heritage has shaped understandings of race and ethnicity in ways that are unique compared to other parts of the United States. In order to understand why this is the case, we must consider the kinds of racial practices carried out under the French and Spanish in the colonial Louisiana. We would then contrast this with social and cultural transformation associated with race that occurred during the period of Americanization that followed the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Finally, we will consider how this legacy continues to inform understanding of race and ethnicity in New Orleans. All right, so it goes down to talk about racial mystery during the French period of 1718 to 1763. So Louisiana was a difficult place for many settlers and residents who embarked upon life in colony. During its early period, it was quite poor and compared to colonies like Saint Dominique to the South, it was considered to be a cultural backwaters. Socially white men found a significant lack of white sexual partners. As a result, they turned to African and Native American women with whom they entered into either forced or consensual sexual relationships. And it goes on to say, in some cases, the interracial relationship between white men and women of African descent were conducted within the framework of an informal institution called plaque. In a plaque relationship, the white men agreed to provide a certain level of economic support to the woman and the following offspring that came from that come from the union. These were complex relationships that could be characterized on a continuum from coercion to consent. In some cases, there was more coercion than consent. In others, however, there was a mutual agreement between the man and the woman to enter into a sustained in I mean in, enter into and sustain the relationship. Although relationships could not be legal, legalized because the law forbade missed marriages, the system of plaque became an accepted social institution in the colony. All right, so not to go any further, but you guys kind of get the idea. Um, the book is called The American Creoles, the Francophone, Caribbean, and the American South. All right. Okay, so we, oh, we got another Islander. Oh, we got another Islander in the building. We got somebody that's from Dominica. Shout out to Henry. Henry from Dominica. Uh, is your last name is Pake? I think that's how you say the last name, Pake. All right, so he's from, so he from Dominica. And we got somebody that's from St. Lucia by the way of St. Vincent. That's cool. See, that's great. It's all about bringing the unifi unification. And the whole purpose is to be able to bring the, uh, African diaspora together and just the African people all over the world. But, you know, especially with the African diaspora to bring us all together and be able to study the history as one as a whole. So it's a lot of things that we don't know and we may be oblivious to. And it's only fair that these information be able to come into the public eye and people will be able to know. So you are more than welcome. Okay, um, so that's that book. And let's see. So we got this book right here, which is called, which is called In the Force of Freedom, Fighting Maroons of Dominica. Uh-oh, Fighting Maroons in Dominica. All right. Now, right here, here's the table of content. All right, here's a statue. So the statue is I can't really read that. Try to zoom this up. So it says the neg 
Maroon Emancipation Statue unveiled on Emancipation Day of August of 2013. All right, so let's go down here where it says, zoom that back a little bit. Where it says, a lasting memorial, the leaders of liberty. So going down, it says, Your Excellency, the President and Mrs. William, Acting Prime Minister, Honorable Ambro George, Minister of Culture, Youth, and Sports, Honorable Justina Charles, other members of Cabinet and the House of Assembly. And it says, in a social historical study of Dominica carried out in 1984, the Haitian historian Jean Jean Cosmere noted that the Dominica showed the effects not so much of a plantation society but of a maroon society. He argued that a late and weak plantation system in Dominica had resulted in a less colonized and thus less regiment and more open modern society. Briefly, Dominica was the last island in the Caribbean to be colonized. It rubbed mountainous nature, enabled to, I mean, enable it to be one of the last places of refuge for the region, region's indigenous people. The Kalinago, when the British took over the island in 1763, there were already more than 300 Maroons living in a small settlement in the interior. As British and French planted opened up more land for sugar and coffee and imported more enslaved labor, so did Maroons' numbers increase plantation and village clung to the coast while inland a vast jumble of plant what's it of forest let me let me try to zoom this up oh okay of forest ravens ravines cliffs and river valleys combined to create a complex natural maze which confounded the British forest, which attempted to reduce the maroons by any means possible. All right. So that's that book. And I'm going to put up one last book. One last book, and then I'm done. All right, so this one is called They Call Us Braggans or Braggans, the Sega of St. Lucia Freedom Fighters, right? So this book is written by Robert J. Duvall. All right. So go into the story about St. Lucia and the Maroons, because this is all that I was able to find. All right, so going down here, it says, Prelude to Freedom. 
Maroonage must have occurred from the very beginning of slavery in the West Indies. So the natural instinct to be free would have compelled some of the slaves to es attempt escape even at the risk of being punished when caught. It seems that the act of Maroonage was dealt was dealt with very severely according to Gatchet. It was not uncommon for a slave to be killed for maroonage and sometimes just for attempting to escape. Aiding and sheltering away runaway slaves was also a serious offense with offenders sometimes punished more severely than the recaptured runaway. So the life of a runaway slave was never easy as it was dependent upon whatever saucer could be obtained from the existing slave communities, the runaway slave had to become extremely resourceful, cunning, and independent in order to live and survive in a state of apparent freedom. They built shelters in the forest where they could live off the land while maintaining contact with sympathetic slaves attached to nearby estates. And organized society must have developed among the runaways in the forest of St. Lucia, just as it did among the Maroons of Jamaica. The frequently the frequency of incursions against the states would have required discipline, a good communication system, and a well-supplied base camps. So it says slaves in the West Indies had numerous opportunities to escape, particularly during hurricanes or periods of confusion. They will sometimes create the confusion, setting fires, or causing some other di diversion. The great number of escapes occur in wartime during the confusion of a battle equally among the Negro military laborers as among the estate slaves. So it, it says the first recorded instant of attempted escapes by slaves in St. Lucia occurred in December 1772, I mean 1722, when the British Montague colonists were trying to establish a settlement at Carnage Bay, Two young Negroes ran away from the French planters located at Chalk and tried to gain access into the British colony, but were promptly returned to the owner. So as early as 1744, the St. Lucia militia was established primarily to keep order among the slaves and to recapture runaways. Recapturing runaway slaves were nearly impossible in the wooded interior of St. Lucia. It was no different 90 years later at the time of emancipation. So the first recorded rebellion of slaves in St. Lucia was in 1748, after the island had been declared neutral by the Treaty of Aix la Chapelle between the British and French. The slaves took advantage of the unsettled situation, leaving their estates after burning the houses and attempting to kill the white owners. Governor de Longueville had to use force to restore order and bring the slaves back under suggestion. So it is reasonable to assume that not all slaves returned to bondage. They preferred to remain hidden and free in the lust of forest of St. Lucia. At this early stage, two types of runaways were occupying St. Lucia forests. The individual fugitive who trusted no one and the runaway who sought out others for mutual comfort and support. There were approximately 2,000 slaves in St. Lucia at the time, of which an estimate of 5% runaways would provide the equivalent of a military company of about 100 men roaming freely in the woods. Their survival needs and the fear of capture would mold them into potential guerrilla fighters. Thus began St. Lucia first organized runaway ancestors of Bargans who, uh, who almost half a century later would control the island for a brief time. So th that's just a little bit about the Maroons and why they was called Bargains. So let's look at what the Bargains is, and then I'm uh, in this video. All right, so Bargains or Braggins, excuse me, Braggins is a member of a gang that ambushes and robs people in forests and mountains. 
All right, so check this out. According to Wikipedia, So it says, the Brigadiage is the life and practice of highway robbery and plunder. It is practiced by the Brigant, a person who usually lives in a gang and lives by pillage and robbery. So basically, the Maroons, right, in St. Lucia, they were robbers. They were waiting for and they would rob those in particularly those who were slave masters, right, to be able to get by and survive and to live. So these Maroons were rebellious slaves that ran away from the plantation and they were not going to tolerate. They weren't going to take it. They were going to do whatever is necessary for them to get away from the plantation and to survive. All right. So anyways, that's all I have. Let's see. Let me go back to read the comments. So yes, Creole Day is tomorrow. Yes. It says the World Creole Music Festival is Friday to Sunday. Yeah, Friday to Sunday. Yes, I did look into that. Okay, well, you know, and you're in Dominica right now. So I hope you guys enjoy yourself. I really do. I wish I can come out there and celebrate. I wish I can come out there and enjoy the meal and have a good time, enjoy the festivity, and just be able to relax. But I'm in the States. I'm in the United States, so I, I can't even come out there and travel if I want to. But eventually, one day, I'll be looking to travel, and I'll be looking to go into different places outside the U.S. I really want to do that because I really want to be able to see the world for itself and see other opportunities available. All right. All right then. So um with that being said, I thank you guys for watching the video and uh I hope you guys enjoy some of the information that I posted. Okay. And if you guys look in my description link right underneath the video, you'll see the list of books that I have uh put up as far as the sources. So you guys can check out those sources for yourselves. And yeah, check out the sources for yourselves and uh, go from there. So again, shout out to all my Creole people, shout out to my Islanders, shout out to all the brothers and sisters here in America, in American South, that's a Creole background, shout out to y'all. And I hope everybody enjoy themselves. I hope everybody is safe. So, and I hope y'all have a good celebration of the festival, okay? So until next time, may peace and power elevation be to all of you. And this is your girl Tiffany, and I'm logging on saying deuces. And y'all have a good one, all right? Thank you so much.